Tuesday, July 23rd, 1861. Such a horrid sight. A long car with dead and wounded was at the depot. The latter were being carried to the hospital. Another train came up whilst we were there, and our noble President Jefferson Davis was on board. All rushed forward to shake hands with him. He gave us a beautiful little speech, telling us of our glorious victory. And so reads Fanny Page Hume's diary entry for July 23rd, 1861, just two days after the first major land engagement of the American Civil War, the Battle of First Manassas. Already, the horrors of war were arriving by the trainload at the depot at Orange Courthouse, followed closely by the politicians. It's a song, a sigh of the weary. Hard times, hard times, come again no more. Many days have you lingered round my cabin door. Oh, hard times, come again. More famous communities for which epic battles are named certainly experienced the living nightmare that was the Civil War. Gettysburg is one such community. But after the soldiers moved on, after the burial parties completed their grisly task, after the famous speech was delivered, Gettysburg returned to relative normal. Not so with Orange County. The war and its horrors were felt here from April of 1861, as Confederate conscripts passed through town by the thousands until March of 1865 when the last soldier, a Union cavalryman, died at the Samuel P. Moore Receiving Hospital in Gordonsville. Although neighboring Spotsylvania County to the east holds the tragic distinction of being the most fought over territory in the nation, the residents of Orange County, Virginia certainly endured extraordinary hardship for all four years of the Civil War. Daily life in Orange, very definitely, uh, the rhythms changed. I mean, this was not like Waterbury, Connecticut, or Springfield, uh, Illinois. Uh, things changed. The rhythm of life was not totally disrupted. They, you still chopped wood and you fixed food and, and uh, tended your garden. Most of the eligible men in Orange went away to war, including Fanny Page Hume's brother Frank, to whom she constantly sent care packages. The local units of the 13th Virginia would lose 60 men by the end of the conflict. Early on, Fanny Page Hume and her grandparents nursed six soldiers at their home near today's Selma Road. A South Carolinian died in her parlor. 1861, Orange was a real area. Uh, the Virginia Army was up at Manassas in Centerville and Orange was sending supplies and, and uh, forwarding troops up there. Very exciting, very, very busy. In the spring of 1862, the Confederacy pulled back from Northern Virginia to behind what was known as the Rapidan Rappahannock Line. The Rapidan River, which marks the line between Orange and Madison and Culpeper counties to the north, had become the de facto northern boundary of the Confederacy. The river itself was not such a raging torrent that it couldn't be easily crossed, using numerous fords. In fact, in some places, the river is no wider than a present-day two-lane highway. The obstacle to invading armies was what lay on the southern bank of the river, a series of bluffs known as the Southwest Mountains forming a perfect natural rampart behind which the Confederacy could defend itself. And so when the Confederate military decided that they could not defend to the banks of the Potomac and along the shores of the Chesapeake simultaneously and completely, uh, when they decided they were going to have to pull back and shorten the lines, they came back to those bluffs. And in Orange County, that amounted to a 20 mile long complex of earthworks. And so the Civil War was fought from behind this line, 
forays, skirmishes, scouting parties, and entire campaigns were launched across this line from both sides. The Battle of Orange Courthouse was essentially a probe to find Stonewall Jackson. Jackson's march to meet Pope at the Battle of Cedar Mountain, his subsequent march to Second Manassas, and eventually Antietam, both originated from Orange County in 1862. Robert E. Lee took refuge behind this line barely a month after his defeat at Gettysburg in 1863. His army spent the entire winter here. The ill-fated Mine Run Campaign, the Battle of Morton's Ford, and of course the horrific Battle of the Wilderness in 1864 were all attempts by the Union to cross the Rapidan Line. But it took them a long time to get across that river. And uh, a lot of lives were lost on both sides. A lot more on the north and the south, but the south had the better positions. It's a bad war. The war wars are bad. I've been there, done that. And to come back here to this place, is, it's not a battlefield, but it's, uh, it gets to me, you know. May 11th, 1862. Les, Hattie, and I walked up to church. Mr. Davis gave a fine sermon from the text, and he shall come to judge the world. It was very solemn. The first time I've been to church since it was used as a hospital. It is still very dirty, though it has been repeatedly cleaned. In 1862, cleansers had not yet been developed for removing blood from wooden floorboards. We learn that St. Thomas Episcopal Church was used as a hospital from the diary of a young woman by the name of Fanny Page Hume. Her daily entries during 1861 and 1862 give us a unique glimpse into everyday life in the village of Orange Courthouse during the Civil War. It is full of the usual mundane things that would appear in anybody's diary, what the weather was like, who came to dinner, what she did that day, but she also tells of dealing with the friendly but ragged and hungry hordes of Confederate soldiers that swarmed through her yard. Hunger, thirst, curiosity, and even a little tendency to larceny knows no particular uniform. And... Uh, Unofficially, I think the folks were very happy when the army left. Not all the encounters were unpleasant. May 31st, 1861. Aunt Sarah sent for the convalescent South Carolinians, and we had some delightful music from them on the violin and flute. I never listened to sweeter music. It almost brought the tears, and the thought of those boyish fellows going off to encounter the vicissitudes of war. The residents of Orange County also had to accommodate the streams of people fleeing enemy-occupied territory to the north. In July of 1862, Fanny Page Hume's brother was wounded. He came home to recuperate. Shortly afterwards, Union soldiers came to town. July 17th, 1862. The Yankees are all around us whilst I write. The yard and porches are full of them. Frank barely escaped. Grandpa and Uncle Peyton arrested for aiding and abetting. The man who arrested them was exceedingly harsh and impotent. With that exception, they behaved well, except breaking open the meat house and helping themselves to all that whiskey. We are completely surrounded, campfires raging all around. Fanny, her grandfather, and uncle became refugees themselves, only to come home to see Stonewall Jackson's army now encamped in their yard. Jackson's army crossed the Rapidan Line to fight the Battle of Cedar Mountain in Culpeper County. <laughs> Village residents could hear the artillery barrage from that battle. When Jackson returned victorious, he paroled 400 federal prisoners from the courthouse grounds. 
and from his camp just off of today's Route 15 between Orange and Gordonsville, he marched his men 53 miles in two days, straight into the Battle of Second Manassas. On that march, his army crossed the Rapidan at Somerville Ford. Down. And they've got bands playing on either side. Bands playing, the officers, good staff work. Bands playing on either side. And the troops, uh, as, as one officer says, they surrender their nether garments. <laughs> so he was saying that the, the troops obviously held their clothes over their heads, surrendering their nether garments. They were naked. And they went across the river singing and shouting. There were numerous encounters with the enemy in Orange County during all four years of the Civil War. A skirmish at Willow Grove in July of 1862. Jeb Stewart was caught napping by a Union patrol in Rhodesville a month later. One large, fine-looking officer with a hat too large for him, pulled down to his ears, came out into the yard, unhitched a horse, mounted it bareback, leaped two rails of the bars, and was away like the wind. Ford H. Rogers, 1st Regiment, Michigan Volunteer Cavalry. Back at the house, the Federals discovered numerous personal items, including a broad-brimmed, light brown soft hat with a long feather in it. A Confederate prisoner identified it as Jeb Stewart's. Even more of a prize was a patent leather dispatch case that revealed Lee's intent to advance on Washington prompting Union General John Pope to pull back from southeastern Culpeper County. A few days later, Stewart himself captured Pope's dress uniform, offered to trade it for the hat. But Pope couldn't keep up his end of the deal, for he had no idea what had become of the hat. Stewart got into trouble again a little more than a year later, when he was almost trapped in Madison County. Stewart, who had stopped for a leisurely breakfast and some blacksmithing work at Jack's shop, was surrounded. At one point in this engagement, he fought John Buford in three directions at once. He eventually ran a gauntlet down the turnpike, clattering to safety over the covered bridge at Liberty Mills. On the side of the weary, hard times, hard times come again no more. During the Jack Shop engagement, Lieutenant John Magruder was mortally wounded. He managed to make it home to Frascati, near Somerset, where he died in his mother's arms. All told, the Magruder family lost three sons and a son-in-law to the Civil War. August 2nd, 1862. Another memorable day. Pickets came back carrying a dead man and saying, the Yankees are coming. And sure enough, they soon came rushing by in immense force, firing in every direction at our pickets. On August 2nd, 1862, all hell broke loose on the streets of Orange Courthouse. We're not just talking about skirmishers taking a couple of pot shots at each other. We're talking about a real battle, with blazing guns and clashing sabers, screaming horses, dead and dying men, and in the words of our diarist, Fanny Page Hume, blood in every direction. At the time of the Civil War, Main Street Orange ran pretty much as it does today. Buildings that are still standing include the Courthouse, the Sparks Building, and the Holiday House. The street was only as wide as where two cars can pass. The parking spaces and sidewalks were taken up by buildings and pedestrian walkways, some of them planked and covered by shed roofs. The street itself would be dirt, or dust, or mud. Right where Bellevue is today, Main Street dipped down sharply to the level of the parking lot behind the Sparks Building. That dip in the road was filled in during the winter of 1863-64 by Sam McGowan's South Carolinians, who needed something constructive to do while encamped at Montpelier. The railroad came through Orange right where it does today, although it was only one track that went straight to Gordonsville. 
Today's Norfolk Southern track that turns towards Montpelier, Somerset, and Barbersville had not yet been built. The station, or depot, was located about where the Robertson Fountain is today at the intersection of Short and Church Streets. The story begins with an account by the chaplain of the 5th New York Cavalry, Louis Napoleon Beaudry. General Crawford, with the 1st Vermont, 1st Michigan, and 5th New York, advanced at an early hour to reconnoiter the force and position of the enemy about Orange Courthouse. Scarcely a rebel appeared until the column approached the town. Without opposition, the advance entered the town, whose streets they found deserted, while a stillness like that of death seemed to reign all around. But suddenly, volley after volley broke the stillness and proclaimed the presence of a heavy force of the enemy. The 7th Virginia Cavalry, under the command of General William Grumble Jones, responded to this invasion from near Mayhurst. He sent sharpshooters into town along today's Caroline Street. They were under the command of our own John Magruder of Frascati, who was killed 13 months later in the Battle of Jack's Shop. They were able to hold off the Yankee troopers, who were bottlenecked by the narrow street. Meanwhile, Jones sent Major Thomas Marshall up the railroad tracks in a flanking maneuver that temporarily caused the Federals to retreat in some confusion down today's Madison Road and Mayfray Avenue. The Federals reorganized and counterattacked, running the outnumbered Confederate troopers out of town. The fight was furious in the narrow streets, and just as the enemy's column began to waver, Captain Hammond, who had fought the enemy at the depot, and was now partially surrounded, with drawn sabers, charged upon the rebels in his front, crying as he flew forward, Give them your hardware, boys. And they did the work most heroically. Tremendous were the blows they dealt, and the street was strewn with unhorsed men whose heads displayed fearful gashes from the Yankee sabers. The enemy could not stand these hardware dealers and fled in the utmost confusion, leaving their dead and badly wounded in our hands. The great number of these only showed how determined and gallant had been our attack. Fifty prisoners were captured, including a major, a captain, and two lieutenants. Chaplain Louis Napoleon Baudray, 5th New York Cavalry. Though their voices are silent, their pleading looks will say, Oh, hard times come again no more. For all intents and purposes, the Battle of Orange Courthouse was over. Many were wounded on both sides. They took 25 or 30 of our men prisoners, brought many of the wounded in our yard. It was a sickening sight, blood in every direction. While we all seek mirth and beauty, music bright and gay, there are frail forms waiting by the door. Though their voices are silent, their pleading looks will say, oh, hard times come again. My first great sorrow was caused by seeing one morning a number of the plantation hands formed in two lines with little bundles strapped to their backs. Men, women, and children, and all marched off to be sold south, away from that was near and dear to them. Parents, wives, husbands, and children, all separated one from another, perhaps never to meet again on earth. The 1860 census of Orange and Green counties in Virginia reports that blacks comprised 52.3% of the population, 8,305 souls, the vast majority of whom were enslaved. The house servants, and by that I mean the slaves, uh, of families in Orange seem to have hung in there uh, all the way through the wall almost without exception. Of course, the alternative meant separation from all that you knew and loved combined with a scary and uncertain future. Reports of contraband were more common closer to Union lines, especially along the Rappahannock River. Many escaped slaves found employment with the Union Army as teamsters, cooks, and orderlies. 
John Washington is a case in point. His memoir, which was penned in 1862, gives us a unique glimpse into what the life of a slave was like in Orange County. When he was a small boy, his mother was hired out to a man by the name of Richard Brown, who had a plantation near the village of Rapidan Station. Washington describes an idyllic pastoral existence on the plantation until one fateful morning he witnessed the dispersal of Mr. Brown's personal property, which included human beings. I shall never forget the weeping that morning among those that were left behind, each one expecting to go next. It was not long before all on that farm was doomed to the same fate. And these that did not belong to the planter had to be sent home to their owner. The farm and the farming implements, stocks and everything was sold. And Mr. Brown removed to Western Virginia. At the time of the Civil War, former Montpelier slave Paul Jennings was living as a free man and a homeowner in Washington, D.C. He is credited with rescuing the Gilbert Stuart painting of George Washington before the British burned the White House in 1814. He was also James Madison's personal valet and witnessed and wrote about the fourth president's death in 1836. And he was involved in an attempt to smuggle 77 slaves to freedom in 1848. During the Civil War, his three sons joined the Union cause, one of them being wounded when he rode into Richmond with the 5th Massachusetts Cavalry. Earlier, at Germana Ford, the United States Colored Troops crossed the Rapidan River into Orange County. That right there is the first time in the war the United States Colored Troops would be used offensively alongside the federal war effort. wouldn't be the last time. They would be engaged in the wilderness, the United States Colored Troops. And it's, it's worth noting that that happened here. One of those black soldiers was captured. On May 8, 1864, he was hanged from a tree in the courthouse yard. It's a song, the sigh of the weary. Hard times, hard times, come again no more. Many days have you lingered round my cabin door. Oh, hard times, come again. Finally, emancipated Montpelier slave George Gilmore built a cabin, possibly using materials salvaged from a Civil War encampment. He built the cabin and farmed the land owned by his former master. Gilmore's direct descendants live in the county to this day, as do the descendants of Chester Lewis. After emancipation, Lewis helped establish the community of Freetown, the birthplace of his granddaughter, the Grand Dam of Southern Cooking, Edna Lewis. What did Orange County look like during the Civil War? Well, it looked pretty much as it does today, minus the power lines, the asphalt, and the buildings that were constructed after the war. But there are still plenty of antebellum buildings standing to this day. Geological features, of course, are the same. Cedar Mountain then looks just like Cedar Mountain today. And there were fewer roads, some of them following different routes than today. You can easily pick out old roads no longer in use, sunken ditches lined with old-growth cedars, locusts, and oak trees. Take the Orange Turnpike, for example, straight as a string from Orange all the way through the wilderness. The trace of the original roadbed stretches through driveways and farm lanes all across the county. And the much more popular Plank Road, which followed today's Route 20 North, branching off at Rhodesville onto today's Route 621. The Blue Ridge Turnpike, today's Route 231, pretty much followed its current route, as did the Rockingham Turnpike, today's Route 33. And strategically placed along these roads from Gordonsville to Wilderness, were taverns, each about nine miles apart from each other, the distance that someone could comfortably walk in one day driving a flock of geese or a herd of cattle to market. The taverns were today's truck stops. 
There is one other difference in how the landscape looked during the Civil War and today. There were far fewer trees, as Culpeper Civil War historian Clark B. Hall describes. Trees disappeared by the thousands overnight as winter huts were fashioned and the forests of this region, this entire region, were transformed into desolate stump lots. Orange County was a popular place for the Confederate Army to camp, not just in winter, but in spring, summer, and fall as well. Robert E. Lee took refuge here behind the Rapidan line barely a month after his defeat at Gettysburg, and he would stay here until early May of 1864. What does General Lee do? He leaves his cavalry in Culpeper County, and he comes right here. He comes right here in August of 1863. At one point, Jeb Stewart was encamped in the Rhodesville area, near the intersection of three important roads. And where we're at, you can't see any of those roads from this location. And right behind this knoll that goes all the way around here was approximately 3,000 or more Confederate cavalrymen out of sight of everybody. That's a wet weather stream right there, which is, it's got water in it right now, and it's July. Another popular Civil War camp area was at James Madison's Montpelier. It afforded plentiful water and wood. Acres of tents sprang up on the grounds. Among the various units camped there was the 3rd North Carolina, who had just come off a fierce fight on Culp's Hill at Gettysburg. On August 20th, 1863, 14 of them deserted. They were caught trying to cross the James River near Scottsville. A firefight erupted and the man sent to catch them was killed. They were tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. It was necessary to make a stern example. And the crime of these men in going off armed, resisting, and firing on the party sent to bring them back and killing the officer was a heinous one. Duty Officer McHenry Howard. On September 5th, they were executed by firing squad. A newspaper account said the first volley did not kill them all. The reserves of which there were two to each squad are ordered up and they have to kill those whom the volley has only wounded. Some six or eight successive shots are fired in this way, showing that probably someone at least had to be fired at probably as often as three times. The deserters were buried face down in a common grave. It cast a gloom over the entire army, for we had never seen so many executed at one time before. John Kessler the burial team. In the fall of 1863, Robert E. Lee launched two unsuccessful campaigns into federally held territory. But that did not signal the end of military operations for the year. There was one more campaign to wage before winter would set in. Reluctantly reacting to pressure from Washington to hit Lee while he was still weak from his defeat at Gettysburg, Union commander George Meade crossed the Rapidan River into rebel territory on Thanksgiving Day, 1863, launching the ill-fated Mine Run Campaign. The fact that the Federal Army was one pontoon short of a span set the tone for things to come. The farce continued as Federal Commander William French got lost not once but twice in the forbidding wilderness. Meade's aide, Theodore Lyman, described French, who was known as Old Gin Barrel, as being comfortably drunk at the time. Five miles left. March. The fight was on when Confederate Commander Edward Johnson ran into French's vastly superior force near the intersection of today's Indian Town and Zoar Roads. Johnson, with about 6,000 men, including the remnants of the Stonewall Brigade, engaged the Federals in and around Payne's Farm. They actually held off the 33,000 Federals until they were rescued by darkness. Among several amusing anecdotes surrounding this battle comes the story of Captain John C. Johnson. Described as a stout man, Johnson issued a challenge as related by a Confederate diarist. 
Thinking that some of his men were not doing as well as they ought, he walked up to the brow of the hill, lay down on its top broadside to the end, and then called to some of his men to come up. If they were afraid, he said, they could use him as a breastwork. Several of them promptly accepted his challenge. They lay down behind him and fired steadily from his position until the fight was over. The gallant captain was not injured. That night, Robert E. Lee ordered his men to withdraw and dig in on high ground on the west bank of Mine Run. The next morning, the Federals launched an attack on the now empty positions at Payne's Farm, further compounding the farcical nature of this campaign. It turned from farce to tragedy when it started to rain, followed by plummeting temperatures. The Federals attempted a flanking maneuver on Lee's right, but ran into unassailable Confederate defensive positions. The mercury sank below zero. Pickets froze to death at their posts. Meade, in one of his usual foul tempers, opted to withdraw back across the Rapidan, much to the relief of his men. A full-scale battle on the order of Chancellorsville had been averted. The retreating Federals did not leave graciously, looting and pillaging their way back to Culpeper County. A tannery was burned to the ground. The library at Elwood was thrown out into the yard. It was now Robert E. Lee's turn to be foul-tempered, as he ordered an attack on the now empty Federal positions. Houses were torn down or rendered uninhabitable. Furniture and farming implements broken or destroyed. And many families most of them in humble circumstances, stripped of all they possessed and left without shelter and without food. I have never witnessed any previous occasion such entire disregard of the usages of civilized warfare and the dictates of humanity. Post was in a shallow ditch on a rock near the river. I kept a small brush fire burning between my legs all the time. Slept about three hours. So cold I thought I would freeze. Before daybreak I got up and built a big brush fire and set up the rest of the night. Grant's army is camped all around Mitchell's and their pickets are just in the edge of the woods on the other side of the river. By mutual agreement the pickets do not shoot at each other. With the arrival of winter, an eerie sort of peace settled over the region. Even though two huge armies were separated by just a narrow band of water, hostilities ceased as they fought a common enemy, the cold. And during the winter of 1863-64, raging inflation, shortages, uh, orange became a valley for woods and uh, particularly with a starving army because Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia spent that winter in Orange County and they were woefully short of supplies all winter long. To make matters worse, the winter of 1863-64 was uncommonly cold. The Potomac River froze over twice, the ice thick enough to support a horse and carriage. Whole forests fell to the axe, fences were dismantled, barns pulled down, all to feed the campfires and build the winter huts. Conditions in the Union camps in Culpeper County were by some accounts almost luxurious. Soldiers dined on oysters and condensed milk. Women arrived, some of them the wives of officers, others posing as such. It was a different world in Orange County. Hunger haunted the men constantly. They raided local storehouses and gardens. By early spring, they were so desperate, they would eat weeds along the riverbanks. It is pokeweed, all sorts of greens that they could augment their coarse cornmeal, which soldiers would talk about cutting their stomach, it was so coarse, fat back, and then hardtack. So and then there was another enemy, disease, pneumonia, typhoid, smallpox, dysentery. Basically, the, their, their toilet facilities consisted of trenches that were about two or three feet wide, about 10 feet long, and the only amenities these trenches had were, these pit, these trench latrines had, were two posts set in the ground and a rail. You imagine, you know, having dysentery, 
and have you know being out exposed in the rain using that kind of facility. I mean, literally, uh, like I mentioned, these camps were to be survived. I mean, On a brighter note, fraternization among pickets was commonplace. Union cavalrymen allowed their southern counterparts to graze their horses on the Culpeper side of the Rapidan line. A mini barter economy sprang up on the riverbanks. After exchanging salutations and arranging for an exchange of papers, a bottle of brandy to be thrown in by the liberal Virginian, I placed my stack of heralds in a small canoe and pushed it out into the stream. And after some little uncertainty as to the successful landing of my little cargo, I had the great satisfaction to see it finally reach the opposite shore in safety. J.S. Moore, 6th Pennsylvania Cavalry. And the most amazing example of fraternization comes to us from Culpeper Civil War historian Clark B. Hall. On one occasion, two opposite centuries befriended each other across the river, and the amiable rebel arranged a date for a Union boy with an Orange County maiden known to history only by the name of Jenny. Furtively crossing the Rapidan and changing into civilian clothes as facilitated by his new rebel friend, the fortunate Yankee was off on an amorous appointment to Orange Courthouse. After returning from his very successful date, the Union soldier returned to the rebel picket and changed back into his blue suit. Just before disappearing across the river, he grabbed the hand of his benefactor, exulting profoundly, Now I know what you barefoot fellas are fighting for. Jenny, get your hope kicked on, my dear. Jenny, get your hope kicked on. No! Shortages were bad enough, now shortages were even more severe. Uh, everything that uh, an army could require, uh, they were trying to find wherever they could. Uh, it, was, uh, it, it was a tight, tight time. In addition to the horrendous toll on human life, the Civil War brought an economic devastation to Piedmont, Virginia. In Culpeper County, if you abandoned your home when you returned, it would be destroyed. Union troops put the torch to Orange County communities as well. The Union military burnt the mill at Rapidan. The bridge, the railroad bridge at Rapidan was burnt I don't know how many times and replaced. When prisoner of war George Payton came home in June of 1865, he found the village of Rapidan Station in ashes. Raccoon Ford, with communities on both sides of the river, was torched on orders from Virginia native John Newton, who served the Union cause. It is also said that the American Civil War pitted brother against brother. In Orange County, that was literally true with the Halsey brothers of New Jersey. J.J., the eldest, had married into the Jeremiah Morton family. He was a slave owner. Edmund Halsey, the youngest, served in the 15th New Jersey Volunteers fought each other throughout the war just to show you and, and we wanted to make this stop in particular because this was a war of brother against brother and right here that story is is a uh, is told J.J. Halsey's father-in-law Jeremiah Morton was among other things an accomplished architect designing and building homes on both sides of the river wealthy and prosperous he invested everything he had in the confederacy he emerged from the war a broken man as he termed it, I stand a blasted stump in the wilderness of life. Morton's Ford on the Rapidan is named after the Morton family, and it was here on February 6, 1864, that federal troops, mostly from the 14th Connecticut, were involved in what was termed a curious affair. Hatched by Union General Benjamin Butler as a diversion while he attempted an approach of Richmond from the south, the effect was to tip the federal hand as to how they would proceed once spring came. In a driving sleet, the 14th Connecticut splashed across Morton's Ford, being egged on by the stone-drunk Union General Alexander Hayes, who was swinging an axe over his head. The Richmond howitzers on the high ground were waiting for them. Confederate Commander Richard Ewell raced to the scene from his headquarters at Morton Hall, promising the speedy arrival of reinforcements who drove the Federals back across the river. 
By the end of the day, the Union had suffered some 300 casualties, compared to 55 Confederate killed and wounded. One of those Federal casualties was the 14th Connecticut's bearer of the national colors, Amory Allen. He had borne our flag and survived the battles of Chancellorsville and Gettysburg, only to be cut down in an Orange County cornfield. A lot of these guys are still buried here. A lot of these guys are still buried here, which makes this not only a uh, pristine, iconic Civil War historical site, it makes it a cemetery. And, uh, And for that reason, principally, it should be respected and honored. My camp is near Mr. Erasmus Taylor's house, who has been very kind in contributing to our comfort. His wife sends us every day buttermilk, loaf bread, and such vegetables as she has. I cannot get her to desist. While his corps commanders lived in relative luxury at Mayhurst and Morton Hall, Robert E. Lee spent the winter of 1863-64 in a tent. Suffering from angina, he complained privately to his wife of the cold. The much-beloved Confederate commander worshipped regularly at St. Thomas Episcopal Church. His pew is located there to this day, along with his position in the sanctuary. And legend goes that when he was attending services, he tied Traveler to a locust tree in the churchyard. A descendant of that tree is growing there to this day. Lee's primary observation point was the top of Clark Mountain, which, at 1,082 feet, was the tallest of the southwest mountains. That chain of hills along the south bank of the Rapidan River had served him well as a natural rampart for the Army of Northern Virginia. From this point, he could see the disposition of the Federal Army of the Potomac. In fact, the Confederate Signal Corps would occasionally communicate with their Federal counterparts atop Pony Mountain in Culpeper County. They would trade off-color jokes and comment on each other's baseball games. Spring had sprung. Confederate officers sent ambulances around Orange County to pick up eligible young ladies and transport them to a ball at Montpelier. As the young officers danced the night away, General Jubal Early was overheard speaking to the chaperones. If any of you have any messages that you'd like to deliver to the hereafter, I think you can leave them with any of the men out here dancing. Early's prophecy would prove correct. Although the 120,000 man strong Federal Army was stirring, Robert E. Lee took the time to participate in a ceremony that had nothing to do with the preparations of war. It was the christening of the daughter of his friend and Corps Commander Ambrose Powell Hill. On Sunday, May 1st, Lee came to Hill's headquarters at Mayhurst, not to discuss war, but to welcome Lucy Lee Hill to the church. Baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Sanctify this water... Just four days later, the slumbering giant in Culpeper County awoke and began to move. Grant's overland campaign had begun, and Lee had correctly predicted that he would cross the Rapidan at its eastern end. The Union military made the decision in the late spring of 1864 to start using coastal shipping as a way of supplying its army instead of railroads. At midnight, May 4th, the Federal Army started to march. The train was some 21 miles long, with 5,500 wagons, 34,000 horses, 22,000 mules, 850 ambulances. As the day warmed, thousands of blue greatcoats littered the roadside, cast off by the marching soldiers. In Orange County, Sam McGowan South Carolinians at Montpelier were given a scant half hour to pack up, fall in, and march. When soldiers crossed Mine Run, they littered the roadside with playing cards, which were considered an instrument of evil and bad fortune. Little did they know the hand they had been dealt 
for this was the beginning of the end for the Confederacy. bullets swished by in swarms. It seems to me I could have caught a potful of them if I'd had a strong iron vessel rigged on a pole as a butterfly net. The Battle of the Wilderness started in earnest in and around Saunders Field in Orange County. It was one of the few open spaces in the area in which you could wage a conventional battle. A century prior to the Civil War, 75 square miles of forest had been laid to the axe to feed iron smelting furnaces. Because the soil was so poor, what came back was an entanglement of underbrush, vines, and stickers. In the words of one diarist, a jungle of switch, 20 or 30 feet high and more impenetrable than pine. Union 5th Corps Commander Governor K. Warren had established his headquarters at the Lacey home, Elwood, which almost exactly a year earlier had served as the Confederate rear in the Battle of Chancellorsville and as the final resting place of Stonewall Jackson's amputated arm. Ordered to attack the advancing Confederates on the Orange Turnpike, Warren delayed until Generals Meade and Grant paid him a visit. Soldiers in the 146th New York Regiment marched into the jaws of hell. Of the 529 men who crossed that field, only 268 came back. To make matters worse, the field and surrounding forest caught fire. Wounded were consumed by the flames. And then silence, as both sides watched a Confederate and a Federal, who had taken cover in a swale, settle their differences with a fist fight in the middle of the turnpike. The Confederate won and was allowed to escort his prisoner unmolested to his lines, at which point the battle resumed in all its ferocity. That night, among the cries of the wounded and the song of a whippoorwill, Federal troops listened to the axes of Ewell's Corps building earthworks. Behind these structures, one well-armed man could hold off four attackers. The next day, May 6, 1864, most of the action occurred along the Plank Road, today's Route 621, and in and around another clearing in the underbrush, the Widow Tap Field. Union General Winfield Hancock routed poorly positioned Confederates in A.P. Hill's Corps. And then, like the bell of the ball who shows up at the last minute, James Longstreet's corps arrived. His Texans in the vanguard had marched all night long and straight into battle. Robert E. Lee was so inspired that he tried to lead them himself. They refused, saying they would only go forward if he would go back. Meanwhile, enterprising Confederates took advantage of an unfinished railroad cut through the wilderness to flank the Federals. Hancock later testified that it rolled me up like a wet blanket. And then disaster struck. Longstreet, who was riding along the plank road with South Carolinian soldiers in dark uniforms, were mistaken for Federals. Billy Mahone's men fired. Longstreet was horribly wounded in the neck and shoulder, but he would survive the war. Meanwhile, in the underbrush north of Saunders Field, John Gordon launched a flank attack through today's Lake of the Woods community. It caused some confusion and panic in the Union lines. Ulysses S. Grant, who had spent both days of the battle sitting on a stump, whittling and smoking cigars, finally arose. Oh, I'm heartily tired of hearing what Lee is going to do. Some of you seem to think he's suddenly going to turn a double somersault and land in our rear and on both of our flanks at the same time. Go back to your command and try to think what we are going to do ourselves instead of what Lee is going to do.
The Battle of the Wilderness sputtered to a close, a bloody stalemate claiming some 23,000 casualties. But in a way, it was a Union victory because Grant did not retreat back across the Rapidan line as his predecessors had. For this, he would be cheered by his men. I think the Army has found a leader who will lead us through a sea of blood to victory. Union Diarist. Still, it would take Grant 11 more months to force Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox. It's a song, a sigh of the weary. Hard times, hard times, come again no more. Many days have you been around my cabin door. Oh, hard times, come again. Gordonsville was a thriving community by the middle of the 19th century. With the arrival of the railroad in 1840 and the extension of the Rockingham and Blue Ridge turnpikes, it became a vital crossroads, both dirt and iron. A lively backcountry trade had developed where farmers and manufacturers from as far away as the Shenandoah Valley brought their products to Gordonsville for shipment to market by rail. At the time of the Civil War, if you wanted to travel by rail, north, south, east, or west, you had to go through Gordonsville to get there. The Exchange Hotel was built near the depot. At the other end of town, the Gordon Inn was doing a brisk business at the intersection of four vital roads. In March of 1862, when the Confederacy pulled back behind the Rapidan-Rappahannock line, the Samuel P. Moore Receiving Hospital was moved from Manassas to Gordonsville, where it remained for the rest of the war. Connected by telegraph to hospitals in Richmond, Farmville, and Lynchburg, the facility served to sort out the trainloads of sick, wounded, and dying men and send them on to whatever hospital had room for them. Civil War wounded arriving in town would become a common sight. Under the command of Dr. Brewerton Monroe Levy of South Carolina, the hotel building itself was used for administrative offices, doctor's quarters, a dispensary, a surgery, and a few wards for sick and wounded officers. The rank and file were housed in a sea of tents pitched on the surrounding grounds. The overflow were accommodated in private homes and businesses throughout the town. In an 11-month period from July of 1863 until May of 1864, 23,000 men came through this facility, 6,000 in one month alone. Miraculously, of the 70,000 men who came through here throughout the entire war, less than 800 died. They were reinterred in Maplewood Cemetery in 1866. Local units included the 7th Virginia Cavalry and the Gordonsville Grays Company C of the 13th Virginia Infantry. Because of its railroad connection, Gordonsville was also extremely important strategically. If the Union could capture it, and it tried to constantly, it could sever Lee's connection to his breadbasket in the Shenandoah Valley. After the Peninsula Campaign, Stonewall Jackson moved 12,000 men to Gordonsville by rail. They camped in and around the town, Stonewall himself staying at the Gordon Inn and worshipping at the Gordonsville Presbyterian Church. Union General John Pope marched on Gordonsville from Culpeper in August of 1862, and Jackson turned him back at the Battle of Cedar Mountain. Another attempt by the Union to capture Gordonsville resulted in the Battle of Trevilians in June of 1864. But the Federals never did capture the town, although they came close on December 23, 1864. It was during this campaign that we learned the story of Nanny Goss, with her father away at war and her mother bedridden upstairs with a newborn child, 16-year-old Nanny Goss found her home in Somerset surrounded by Yankees. She hid the servants, the silver, and even her pony in the basement, marched down to the regimental commander's tent, and demanded he post a guard on the house. The astonished Federal complied. Nanny Goss would go on to marry Captain Robert Stringfellow Walker of Mosby's Rangers, and together, with the help of his sister, they founded Woodbury Forest School. 
Back to the Battle of Bell's Mountain, also known as Torbett's Christmas Raid. Yankee cavalrymen had crossed the Rapidan at Liberty Mills and advanced up the Blue Ridge Turnpike. The weather was awful. In fact, six of the ten days devoted to this campaign, it either rained, sleeted, or snowed. A first-person account comes from Private Abraham Shockey of Company G of the 17th Pennsylvania Cavalry. He relates how Confederate reinforcements brought up from Richmond by rail were waiting for them at the base of what is today's Cameron's Mountain. Having been thrown from his horse, Shockey took cover in a shallow depression. In this place, I was joined by William Cooper and Sergeant David Royer of my company, the latter badly wounded. We were in short range of the enemy, who were hidden by a barricade. We could hear their voices in ordinary conversation, and the report of a rifle and the whiz of the bullets were simultaneous. I took Comrade Royer by the hand and bade him goodbye forever, sprang to my feet and ran with all my might for my life. A volley was fired after me as I made my way over the hill. I had to cross a brook partly covered with ice. I then had to crawl again on the ground, and in climbing over a fence was again exposed to the fire of the enemy. I continued to hug the ground until I was out of range, and soon again mingled with the boys who rejoiced on account of my miraculous escape and safe return. All told, Torbert would lose 258 horses in this campaign. In those days when you ran out of fuel, you parked your vehicle along the side of the road, removed the tack, made sure the horse could not be used by the enemy, and walked. Also, seven federal troopers were killed in this engagement. Sergeant David Royer, the man who was so gravely wounded, in Shockey's account, being one of them. He was taken to the hospital in Gordonsville, where he died on Christmas Eve. It's a song the sigh of the weary Hard times, hard times, come again no more Many days have you lingered round my cabin door Oh, hard times, come again August 10th, 1861. Poor Mr. Taylor is no more. He died this afternoon between 7 and 8 o'clock. I feel as if someone near and dear to me has gone. He had been delirious except as intervals since last evening. Let us pause in life's pleasures and seek its many tears while we all sup sorrow with the poor. Tis a voice that will linger forever in our ears. Oh, hard times come again no more. Tis a song, the sigh of the weary. Hard times, hard times come again no more. Many days have you lingered round my cabin door. Oh, hard times come again no more. Historians now estimate that there were as many as 750,000 combatant deaths in the American Civil War. Previous estimates had put that number at 622,000. Even more shocking is that two-thirds of those deaths were attributable to non-wound-related disease. That's almost half a million men. Take Alexander Bedingfield of the 43rd North Carolina Infantry Regiment, for example. He came down with pneumonia and died at the Samuel P. Moore Receiving Hospital in Gordonsville at the age of 23. He never got a chance to meet his infant son, Eugene. When you consider that 70,000 sick and wounded men came through that exchange hotel facility, it is quite remarkable that less than 800 died there. They were reinterred after the war in Maplewood Cemetery. Civilian deaths were commonplace as well. In the 1860s, a woman had a one in five chance of not surviving the birth of her first child. Families were large because infant mortality was high. Life expectancy in 1860 was in the low 40s. August 29, 1861. Poor Miss Sally Alexander died this morning. McDonald's little boy, Marshall, died too. One of Mr. Robinson's. Death seems all around us. 
Historian Frank Walker tracked the number of deaths recorded in Fanny Page Hume's diary in 1862. Ten local boys killed in the war so far, another eight that she knew of. There are, at the same time in that same year, 25 civilian fatalities within this little community. Deaths were something that people lived with, that understood. Take the case of our diarist Fanny Page Hume. Orphaned at age 20, she laments on her 23rd birthday how old she is getting. In February of 1865, as the war is coming to an end, she marries. Barely four months later, Fanny Page Hume herself is dead at age 26. Sigh that is wafting across the lonely plain, tis a whale that's heard upon the shore. Tis a dirge that is murmured across the lonely grave. Oh, hard times come again no more. Tis a song, the sigh of the weary. Hard times, hard times come again no more. Many days have you lived. Come again, no more. Oh, hard times come again.